Good morning. Welcome to Trading R. I'm Reema Tanduka. With me is Hormuz Fatakia. It's a bit of a tepid Tuesday morning, right? For our markets, lackluster moves coming in on the benchmark indices. Uh, the Nifty is down 65 points at 22,033. Sensex lower by 270 points. But there is action in the broader markets. So the mid cap index is up close to about a half a percent. The small cap index is out, you know, uh, in the green too. The advanced decline ratio, uh, unfortunately, though, is well in favor of the losing side. So if you pull up the advanced decline ratio, you've got about 800 stocks advancing for 1,400, 1,500 stocks declining. So despite the green that you are seeing on the mid and the small cap universe, the advanced decline ratio is firmly in favor of the uh, losing side today. So more declining stocks. Respecting the levels is the yeah. bigger takeaway, right? The Nifty, we've been talking about the 50 DMA at around 21,950 and that is what the index respected this morning as well. We opened at 21,950, we reversed from there 80 points off the day's low but still in the red and that is because the index heavyweights are not contributing to the upside. The Reliance, ICICI Bank, all of them are trading with HDFC Bank as well, all of them trading with losses and they are ensuring that the Nifty does not turn positive as of now. And if you pull up the contributors chart as well, you will get a clearer picture of why the Nifty, despite recovering from the day's low, is still continuing to trade in the negative territory. And as I was speaking about the index heavyweights, there you can see Reliance, HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank, almost 40 points out of the 65 points that the index is trading lower is coming from these three stocks. What is contributing to the upside though is Bajaj Finance, the Bajaj Twins actually, both Bajaj Finance and FinServe and l &T that is doing well. We spoke about the broader markets, the insurance names are doing Doing very well for themselves. HDFC Life is doing well. Max Financial was up 5, 5.5% after the new IRDI regulations. Those stocks are doing very well for themselves. What is not doing well is banks, as I mentioned, HDFC and ICICI and the Nifty Pharma Index is also not doing well for itself as the pharma stocks are seeing a bit of, bit of selling pressure. What is doing well though is realty stocks. They are slightly in the green and metal stocks. Those are the ones that continue to trade in positive territory. Okay, IT too is a bit under pressure. In fact, you know, the Nifty IT index has been the worst performing sectoral index in the month of March with the Nifty IT index down 7%. They were under a lot of pressure on Friday after Accenture cut its full year FY24 revenue guidance. When they declared their Q2 numbers, and for Accenture, it's an August ending year, the company is now saying the revenue growth will be 1 to 3 percent versus their earlier guidance of 2 to 5 percent. So that spooked the street a bit, which was hoping for a quick recovery. And as we count down to the fourth quarter earnings season, which should start after the 10th of April, what is expected from the IT companies? Are we you know, is there going to be an improvement in demand? We're now joined by Girish Pai, consultant research analyst at Nirmal Bang Equities, to take some questions. Uh, Girish, the first question is, you know, Accenture's numbers, right? Done, digested now. What is the implication for the Indian IT services companies and what can we take away? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on your show, Reema. So basically, if you look at what expectations are from the street, for FI25, uh, on the tier one companies, there is a general expectation that uh, US dollar revenue growth would be in the mid single digit territory to high single digit territory. Uh, that actually assumes that there is going to be fairly strong recovery starting second quarter of uh, FI25 onwards till the fourth quarter. Uh, so it's a 2H uh, 24, uh, 2024 kind of recovery that's kind of built in. Now, uh, with Accenture's commentary, and not just Accenture's commentary, there have been whole whole other whole set of other uh, global IT services firms have kind of indicated that 2024 is going to be slightly weaker than 2023, which is which goes against this whole uh, thought process that FI25 is going to be a better year or 2024 is going to be a better year than 2023. So uh, there are quite a lot of players out there in the market who are saying that 2024 is going to be worse than 2023. And this is after assuming a, a recovery in the second half of 2024. So I think uh, people... Uh, the market is a bit jittery about whether we will actually get that mid-single-digit growth, the high-single-digit growth, and whether the guidance that's going to be given by uh, Infosys and HCL Tech and Kofor, these are the only three players uh, in the Tier 1 and Tier 2 set to give guidance. Will that come in a little lower than what uh, the current street and expectations are? Grish, good morning. Thank you for joining in. As far as I can recollect, you've been possibly one of the very few analysts who have been cautious or bearish on the Indian IT space for the longest possible time. And your recent note also suggests that 
the pressure is likely to continue in the current quarter as well. Although you believe that this quarter may be better on a sequential basis just because of higher number of working days. But what are some of the key things that someone should watch out for when it comes to commentary from these larger IT players, Infosys, HCL Tech, of course, the guidance. But what about the rest of the companies? So you need to watch out for whether discretionary spending is about to pick up or not. So there have been like certain companies who've called out green shoots when the third quarter results were announced. Uh, TCS is one of those who kind of indicated that BF is probably is turning around. Wipro kind of indicated that consulting piece, especially Capco, is seeing higher order inflow compared to the previous quarter. So whether that uh, positive commentary on discretionary spending or, or spending per se it kind of broadens, there are more people kind of talking about it. And the other thing uh, is to focus on when is this sharp pickup that one is anticipating? When When is that going to happen? Uh, because as I said, uh, there is a general view that it's going to probably start from you know, the September quarter onwards. Now, what is going to drive that? Is it going to be interest rates? Is it going to be something else? Uh, and as we move into the second half of uh, calendar year 2024, will customers be focused on the U.S. election and what that means from an economic policy perspective of the new president who comes to power? Will that also kind of impact the decision making? So I think those are some of the things that I would kind of watch out for discretionary spending, the, th the thought process around spending in general, because when we heard Accenture and on the call, they kind of indicated that spending in 2024 is going to be weaker than in 2023. So those are some of the points that I would kind of watch out for. And also hiring. I mean, will will the hiring bottom out here? Uh, the job speaks index of uh, InfoEdge, for, in, for instance, indicated a pickup. Uh, is that a sustainable pickup? Will we see, you know, uh, more hiring done by these companies, which is a lead indicator to growth going forward? Mm. Uh, Girish, <clears throat> sorry. According to you, Infi and HCL Tech are likely to guide for a 4 to 7% revenue growth when they report their Q4 numbers for FI25. Uh, will that disappoint the street if they come out with a 4 to 7% guidance, considering you're saying the market is expecting a mid to high single digit kind of a revenue growth? Will we see earnings downgrades if that guidance comes through? No, I don't think we will see a material disappointment if they deliver that 4 to 7% kind of number. I do see some of my peers on the sell side actually having higher, uh, you know, high single digit kind of growth numbers. So they will have probably have to bring those numbers down. But broadly, I think a 4 to 7% kind of number is kind of uh, built into uh, markets thought process for FI25. Only if a, a number below that uh, would, would, be, would be, I would call, disappointing. Right. Uh, Girish, you've mentioned in your note that the deal value, the TCV to revenue conversion cycle is something that you would be watching out for. And you've also mentioned that the larger deal wins has also been muted uh, since September of 2023. Do you see that as a risk to the management commentary as most of man the managements have been saying that FY25 would be better compared to FY24? Would that have an impact on that? Yeah, so I think if you look at management commentary, uh, TCS has clearly called out that FY25 is going to be better than FY24, but by how much, it's not said. Similarly, if you look at Infosys' commentary, while they've not come out and given a, a guidance or any, any view on FY25 specifically, but they've said that the very strong TCB numbers that they clocked in the first half of FY24 would help them in, in, in delivering better numbers going forward, though they didn't mention FY25 specifically. So uh, I would say that, you know, the uh, slightly weakish TCV numbers that have been announced thus far, Q3 was definitely weak, and Q4 thus far, uh, we've not seen any kind of mega deals being announced by anybody on the street, uh, though there was a one Aviva order of TCS, but I think that's an expanded order from uh, an existing client. So uh, we've not seen any big mega deals being announced by any of the big players, uh, any of the tier one players. So... I would be a little wary of that, whether that is going to lead to, uh, you know, some cautiousness in, in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the guidance that they're going to give is something we need to watch out for. And the other thing is this whole uh, situation around conversion from TCV to revenue. Uh, I think this is a problem which we've been facing for the last 12, 18 months. I think that is set to continue going forward is, is my view. Mm. How do U.S. elections typically impact Indian IT? And is a change in regime very significant 
in terms of you know spending taxation cuts does it impact the way valuations of it or the earnings growth of it what does history tell us about the impact of us elections on indian it uh, uh Bhima, i've not really studied the historical pattern but my sense is that uh, the current election could be a bit of a different situation because uh, donald trump who is a key candidate out there and who a lot of media polls kind of uh, tell tell us that he may potentially be a winner uh, has got some very radical uh, policies kind of lined up especially on tariffs he's kind of indicating that he's going to levy 60% tariffs on chinese goods 10% tariffs on most other countries who kind of uh, exporting to the us he's talking about immigration in a very big way which apparently contributed to lowering a uh, wage inflation in the us so there's been a lot of illegal immigration that you you and i have been reading about in the press apparently that's been has had a positive impact on inflation in the us now he's saying that he's going to uh, stop that and even deport some of these illegal immigrants now whether that is going to have an impact on inflation and and uh, stuff like that is going to be something to be watched out for and again this whole tariff thing could have impact on supply chain uh, of all these uh, global corporations and uh, whether that is going to lead uh, to a greater deal of uncertainty in their minds and whether they're going to go into a freeze mode is something we need to watch out for so according to you if uh, the current regime continues biden continues it may be more positive for indian it prima facie because donald trump could be more disruptive i would think so i would think so uh, there's going to be more uncertainty is all i can say but donald trump trump could also be positive from some other perspective uh, he is much more free market i think uh, he's probably going to lower corporate taxes and uh, taxes for households he's also talking about st stopping the ukraine war uh, almost immediately i don't know how that's going to happen but if that happens then you're going to probably see lower energy prices so you could probably see a lot of commodity prices kind of come off which could be positive from an inflation standpoint so it's a very mixed picture on inflation there are certain items on his policy agenda which are going to probably lead to higher inflation there are other things that is got which probably could be working on the other side All right Girish thanks a lot for joining in and sparing a time to discuss what's anticipated for the IT companies as we head into the earning season for the final quarter of FY24 that was Girish Pai there of Nirmal Bank time for a short break here on Trading R up next we'll discuss what's buzzing in the commodity space Manisha Gupta joins us on the other side stay tuned Welcome back. You're watching Trading R here on CNBC TV 18. The markets continue to remain where they are. The Nifty is now at 22,034, still remaining at that level as we begun the show at 80 points off the lowest point of the day. The metals index is continuing to gain strength. It's now up three tenths of a percent, and the mid cap index continues to surge higher now six tenths of a percent. for the nifty mid cap index and the small cap index too is piling on is building on the gains actually is the three tens of a percent higher and the stocks that are not doing well though are some fmcg names that are not doing well the pharma index though is recovering from the days the days low the nifty pharma index is now almost set to turn positive so good going there for the pharma index but if you look at the stocks that continue to not do well are the index heavyweights reliance hdfc bank and icici bank they continue to put pressure on the index while on the flip side the bajaj twins lnt and coal india is also for doing well for itself in today's trading session but let's shift focus now to the commodity space manisha gupta is joining in and today we focus on the new hot commodity on the block that is coco manisha good morning what's brewing there well homers a uh, plenty really <laughs> because we're looking at the prices at an all time highs and that's what uh, coco really has done it has been hitting strong strings of all time highs in the past 3 or 4 months now so for where we stand right now we're trading at 9400 dollars a ton overnight we've seen the coco prices gain up by 7% when you look at this week itself we are up by nearly 18% and for the month of march the prices have gained up by 45% if you look at the last 12 months itself the coco prices are up by nearly 233% so as you can see this has been one of the best performers within the agricultural commodities and within overall commodities as a sector as well well the reason for the run up in prices has been poor harvest in the major producing countries which is ghana and ivory coast the market 
have seen concerns whether it has been about the aging cocoa trees uh, it has been weather which has been very erratic in both of these countries as well it also has to do with disease and then it also has to do with the fact that you are looking at uh, crop damage coming in as in sense of numbers when you look at Ghana the crop estimates earlier were at around 800,000 tons which now are talked about at 650,000 tons also when you look at uh, Ivory Coast we're looking at a crop which is down by 33 percent on an year-on-year -year basis so last year if the crop was at 600,000 tons this year it's anticipated at 400,000 tons so lower inventory and higher pricing also has led to processing companies buying less of cocoa beans right now so well absolutely anything that is cocoa or chocolate you are looking at those things getting pricier as well okay thank you very much for that staying with cocoa chocolate and coffee it's time now for an important corporate conversation Mangala Malu my colleague caught up with Sushant Dash the CEO of Tata Starbucks to get a sense of the company's financials consumer preferences how they're changing and he began the conversation by asking how the company is likely to end this fiscal year listen in to excerpts from that conversation so we should be good uh, as you said the last two years for us has been about rapid expansion if you look at it uh, in the last two and a half years we have nearly doubled our store count right. in three years time we did 50 stores we then did 70 odd stores last year and hopefully we'll break that number this year uh, we are 410 stores as we speak we opened a new store this morning in Varanasi uh, which also takes us to now, I think, 60-odd cities. So it is not just about the store expansion, it's also about the places that have, we have been to. Typically, quick service restaurants do anywhere between 18 to 20 percent as EBITDA margins. Starbucks, we know, is profitable. So what's the kind of EBITDA margins that you guys operate at? Again, I will not share numbers. But as you know, as you rightly said, we, we, we became, we, we were cash profit for a while now. Yeah. We became profitable at an EBITDA level last year, which we declared. And I think that was something that was actually very, uh, a sense of pride. And in some ways, it also gave us the confidence that we now know the model well. Because it, was, it came on the back of rapid expansion. Right. It came on the back of a contraction in the base numbers because of the previous two, three years in terms of COVID. But irrespective of all of that, to come back, grow stores, invest behind much higher number of stores and still uh, crack the profitability uh, parameter, I think gave us the confidence that we now know uh, enough about this market and how where we want to go. But the rapid expansion plan is still on. You'll be opening one store every three days for the next two and a half years as I can see. What's the kind of uh, investment that you're making per store? Roughly two and a half to three crore? Again, I will obviously not share numbers, but for us, the store is what is most important. Uh, and we are proud of what we achieve in that. Having said that, we obviously understand the financial guardrails and we'll continue to have a strict control on that so that we continue to be profitable and you know get the right returns. How is the revenue mix of a store typically for Starbucks? What proportion comes in from hot beverages, how much of it comes in from cold beverages. We're speaking around summer right now, we've launched a new product. What proportion comes in from food and in that as well, how much is sweet, how much of it is savory? So, in terms of numbers, uh, if, I, if I look at it, it differs from season to season, as you yeah. said rightly. Uh, it also depends in terms of markets. You know, certain markets, in the initial stages we see there is more preference for blended beverages, uh, which is our frappuccinos. Yeah. And as the market matures and there are more people who come in and understand coffee, there is a movement towards espresso, okay. right? So that is the typical pattern. So in that, in some sense, because Mumbai is the oldest market, we would have more of espresso drinkers here, and hence people having more of Americanos or uh, the lattes, the flat whites. We are a tea drinking nation. Coffee penetration is still 25% amongst among the effluent or people that we are going to. So we need to create the category. And when you are creating the category, the easier drink to have is a blended beverage or a frappuccino. Okay, coffee penetration at 25%. That's a category they're looking to develop and penetrate deeper. Interesting conversation. We'll get into a break. On the other side, we'll discuss market technicals. Mitesh Thakkar joins in next.
Welcome back. Mitesh is now with us once again for a technical check on the markets. Mitesh, while the index is not doing too much, uh, it's the broader markets which is gathering some momentum now. It's building up on the way up. The mid-cap index is a gain of about 0.7%. Thoughts in the first half of the trading session and your stock ideas? I think, you know, the mid-cap index has built up nicely, but the bank nifty is slightly uh, showing some, you know, marginal weakness and that is why the nifty is not moving up. Anyways, my belief is that uh, the nifty could consolidate and I think that's the kind of movement happening, possibly because of underperformance of bank nifty. So I think nifty might do a range of about 22, 250 to about 21,900 and the uh, next couple of days could be spent within this range. On the stock side, Ambuja Cement, you know, is on the uh, buying list. Keep a stop below 587, look for targets of 620. And Apollo Tires is a buy with a stop at 466 for targets of 480. All right, Mitesh, thanks a lot for joining in and sharing with us your specific recommendations on Ambuja Cement as well as your views on the index. That was Mitesh Thakkar there with his views on the index. The index is now up 100 points from the lowest point of the day, nearing the 22,050 mark as we slip into a short break. We'll get you more on the markets and some stocks that are buzzing in today's session on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. One of the big movers of the day is Avenue Supermarts. The stock was up actually 4-4.5%. Four, four now it's trimmed some of its gains, but still holding up with a gain of about 2.5%. ICIC Securities today has upgraded the stock to an ad. Uh, they've also raised the target price. Mangalam is here to tell us the details. Mangalam. Well, brokerages are liking DMART, uh, particularly in the last one week or so. We've seen two notes come by. CLSA recently initiated coverage on DMART with a positive view and today we have a note coming in from ICICI Securities where they've upgraded the stock from hold to buy and at the same time they've increased their target price as well from 4100 rupees to about 4800 rupees increasing their earnings estimates for the next two years by about two to four percent why is it that they like DMART well typically they compare DMART to the most expensive FMCG stock which is Nestle and if you take a look at the valuations the relative valuations between DMART and Nestle you know two years ago it was trading at a 50 percent premium to Nestle's valuation but two years of underperformance of DMART and outperformance of Nestle has meant that this premium of valuation of DMART over Nestle has reduced from 50 percent just to about 8 percent and things are improving for DMART if not then the downside is limited because most of the weaknesses as per ICICI securities is priced in and even at 18 to 20 percent revenue CAGR that the companies posted over the last three years or so it is still a lot higher than the other FMCG peers so they see case for an outperformance of DMART over the near future largely on account of uh, higher than estimated FMCG uh, higher than estimated than FMCG revenue healthy net profit margins and relatively attractive valuations as well on the other side for Nestle they've kept their rating at hold because they believe that, you know, uh, one, the stock has already outperformed and going forward, the growth uh, rate at which it was growing as against other FMCG peers, the outperformance may decelerate as, uh, you know, the pricing power reduces going forward and the pricing has largely been in the base itself. So if they were choosing between Nestle and DMART, their bet over the near to medium term would be DMART. Thanks a lot, Mangalam, for joining in. In fact, the stock made a 52-week high this morning. 45.09 was the highest point of the day for Avenue Supermarts and it's trimmed some of those gains, as Reema was highlighting. It's now at 4,400. But another positive note coming in there for Avenue Supermarts after CLSA initiated coverage last week. But what is also doing very well in today's session are life insurance companies. And that is after the insurance regulator IRDAI approved graded surrender value for the companies. Yash is joining in with more details on this. Yash, can we stick our neck out and say we told you so? Well, exactly. We've been reporting on this one uh, for quite some time now as, uh, you know, it took those steps towards the final clarification which arrived over the weekend. 
So, of course, it's a big overhang out of the way for these life insurance companies. Do remember that in December 2023, the regulator had put out a proposal which suggested increasing the surrender value paid by these life insurance companies. And the increase proposed by the regulator was quite significant, almost two times of what exists today. Uh, now, of course, after multiple back and forth between the industry and the regulatory body, uh, the regulator has finally come out with regulations when it comes to surrender value. And uh, these have been... Been, uh, watered down to a large extent in favor of insurance companies. Uh, the regulators come out with graded surrender value for life insurance policies, which means as the policy progresses towards its maturity, higher the surrender duration, higher would be the surrender value and uh, vice versa. As far as uh, the values which have been given by the regulator, 30% is the surrender value which the regulators decided in the second year, 35% in the third year, 50% between the fourth and the seventh year, 90% in the last Last two years. Now, if you see, uh, if the surrender value would be 30% to about 50% between uh, the second year and the seventh year. And interestingly, most policies, more than 98% of the policies get surrendered before the seventh year, which means that the impact, uh, you know, on the surrender value and for the life insurance companies would be almost nil because large part of insurance companies would continue to come under the same surrender value which exists today. Now, if I had to compare the numbers between what was proposed, which was much higher and what has come about, for the second year, what was proposed was a surrender on a 1 lakh rupee policy annually. What was proposed was a surrender value of 83,750 rupees. What has come about is just 30,000 rupees. In the third year, it was 1.67 lakh which was proposed. What has come about is just 70,000. In the fifth year, what was proposed was about 3.5 lakh rupees. What has come about is just 1.5 lakh rupees. In the seventh year, finally, what was proposed was about seven, uh, five and a half lakh rupees. What has come about is just about three lakh rupees again. So, of course, uh, a significant watered down version of what could have been a big negative impact. Uh, you know, brokerage is estimating about 400, 500 basis points impact on VNB margins. That almost goes out of the way, uh, specifically positive for HDFC Life and Max Life because of the high exposure to non-par segment, uh, Max Life doing particularly well today simply because of the valuation comfort also going along with the positive news from the regulator. Okay, thank you very much for that. Another stock which is on our radar is Adani Ports and Hormis, you've been looking at it since morning. Well, it was an early morning announcement that the yeah. company made and they have acquired 95% stake in Gopalpur ports. And it was in the news for a while now that they were looking to acquire that stake from the Shapuji Palanji group. And that stake now has been acquired for a cash consideration of around 1,350 crore rupees. But the deal implies an enterprise value of around 3,080 crores. Now, this transaction is likely to be completed by the first quarter of FY25. Now, if you take a look at the breakup of this 95%, 56% of this stake has been acquired from SP Port Maintenance, which is the Shapurji Palanji Group unit. And the other 39% comes from this unit called Orissa Steve Doors. Now, in FY23, Gopalpur ports. Now, it has an overall capacity of 20 million metric tons, but in FY23, it handled overall cargo of around 7.5 million metric tons, a number that is likely to go up to 11.3 million metric tons this year, and it is likely to earn an operational revenue of around 520 crore rupees at the close of this financial year. Now, the management is also saying that they have already identified opportunities for the Gopalpur port, which will achieve higher operational efficiencies for them and also ensure infrastructure debottlenecking and also ensure further value creation for shareholders of Adani ports. But now, as you remember, Reema, in uh, February of this year, Adani ports, when they came out with their monthly mm -hmm. numbers, their cargo volumes were up 33% on a month-on-month -month basis and their overall cargo volumes were at 382 million metric tons, which is very close to its revised guidance, which they had revised at the start of the year of 400 million metric tons for FY24. So they said they are well on course to uh, complete, uh, to achieve and surpass their FY24 guidance. And this Gopalpur port is likely to add around 25 million tons per annum of further capacity to Adani ports. And now their current port handling capacity is around 600 million metric tons. So positive developments there for Adani ports and the stock is doing very well for itself in today's trading session. Okay, another one which is flying high is Interglobe Aviation. It's a fresh lifetime high on that. And the company held its analyst meet very recently and brokerages like what they heard. Sonal joins in with the key takeaways from that analyst meet. Sonal. 
Well, yes, uh, higher in trade today, 4% almost. Uh, the takeaway, the biggest one was that, that they plan to double by calendar year 2030. This is through more planes, through more geographies, including international routes and more destinations as well. What the company says is that their fleet addition continued with eight more planes in the month of uh, Jan and February, taking the total fleet to 366. And from FY25, they plan to add one plane every week. And that is a big number which talks about big capacity coming in for Indigo itself. Management believes that the recent slowdown that they saw in passenger growth or passenger addition uh, as per the DGCA website is more supply-led but the demand continues to be very strong. New airports in Noida and Navi Mumbai that will come by in the next two calendar years will aid growth as well. The new guidance for FY25 for average seat per kilometer per passenger growth is at 11 to 12 percent. On the back of this, Jefferies has uh, upgraded the stock to a hold from an underperform. They've upgraded their yields uh, uh, targets also by 2 percent, the EBITDA estimates by around 14 to 16 percent. Motila Loswal, on the other hand, they have reiterated their neutral rating, have a target price of 3,510 rupees a share. They think the competition in the sector is expected to intensify with the resurgence of Air India and the entry of new players. So they continue to be neutral on the stock. Flying high is Indigo there. Almost 3,500 now. The stock made a new record high in today's trading session. Thanks a lot, Sonu, for joining in. Almost 4% higher now on Indigo at around 3,400. Time for a short break here on Trading R. Up next, we discuss the market's fundamentals with Quantum AMC's George Thomas. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Even as the index trade remains very tepid this Tuesday morning, the small and the mid-cap indices are seeing some smart buying. The mid-cap index has moved to the day's high. In fact, in the last couple of days, we have seen a sharp reversal in the mid and the small cap uh, you know, indices. Uh, but, you know, portfolios, individual stocks are down quite a bit, 20 to 25 percent, you know, for many investors. Now, the key question that we're asking today, is the correction in the mid-caps over or is there more to go? Nimesh is standing by with some data. Nimesh. It's a million dollar question on whether the correction is over. But let me just, uh, you know, tell you as to what has happened in the broader markets in this month. So this month, uh, the returns may look, may look very flat, just... Uh, 1 to 2 percent rally uh, in, in this year so far in mid cap, small cap, and micro cap. But from the all time highs, uh, the mid cap index is down 5 percent, the small cap and micro cap indices are down 10 to 11 percent. So there has been a pain for a lot of the portfolio investors. But to put into context what the mid cap and broader markets have done over the two and three year period, if you just look at the two year and three year period, it's been a massive rally uh, in, in the broader market stocks. L look, at, uh, look at the indices. Mid cap index in two years has given 63 percent, and over three years has given 100 percent returns. In the small cap space, the small cap index has given 45% return over two years and more than 80% return over a three-year period. And say so is the case with the micro cap index as well. That's rallied 86% over the last two years. But the street seems to be quite divided as to where we stand in the, in the current context. Let me give some bull cases. HSBC, for instance, says that the, that the concerns like, uh, oh, uh, like a 2018 kind of a correction, it looks like overdone. A uh, lot, lot of the macros are quite favorable at this point in time. And they do not see a 20 to 30 percent fall in the near term. So they are slightly bullish after the correction in the broader markets. Uh, look at the Jeffrey's note. Jeffrey says that the, co the correction that we saw in the month of March was quite healthy and not a meltdown. And this is strong capex uh, makes a several case for mid cap, mid and small caps to be attractive and option to buy. Similarly, JP Morgan says that while uh, there could be another 5 to 10 percent downside, but they'd see a lot of high exposure to, man to sectors like manufacturing, infra, and green energy can create a lot of alpha opportunities in the, in the, in the weeks to come. So that's, that's a JP Morgan view. But there, is a, there are some who are not so bullish as well. So for instance, Bernstein, they say despite the correction, the valuations are rich, it will be tough to generate alpha in, in this year, and they prefer large caps over, over small caps. But uh, even Kotec believes that while uh, the idea is to move towards high quality names, but the high quality names also have some challenges going forward. So it's a kind of a mixed view from Kotec and Bernstein. I just want to leave with some names which have rallied pretty hard, but the valuation looks quite stretched. So look, if you just look at the list there, IRFC, Aircon, a lot of the PSU names, IRFC is up 400%, but now it's sitting at an expensive valuation. So is the case with REC, 
That stock is up 300% in the last one year. Now trading at uh, expensive valuations of one and a half times price to book. Similar is the case with the other some uh, some PSU names as well, which will come up the street. So look at Hudco, Ircon, Cochin, Shipyard. They all have rallied 200 to 400% in the last one year. But in terms of valuations, it looks stretched for most of the names. So looks like some expensive uh, expensive stocks may underperform. But uh, whether uh, whether the correction is over or not, only time will tell in the broader market stocks. Whether the correction is over or not, only time will tell. And let's pose that question now to George Thomas from Quantum AMC, who is joining us on the show. George, good morning. Thank you so much for joining in. Sticking to that subject of uh, the broader markets, as Nimesh was highlighting, there has been a 10 to 11% correction in the small and micro cap space. But do you see that as the correction being done with? Do you see that there are now pockets of value that are uh, emerging in the broader markets? What's your sense there now? Yeah. So what we have been seeing in the last uh, few uh, last few quarters was uh, there has been reasonable moderation in, in terms of the input prices and RM cost. And that has uh, kind of given a reasonable uh, support in terms of the earnings growth. Uh, but along with that, uh, one other major factor was uh, obviously better flows into those categories and, and how the trading volumes kind of panned out. So if you look at different segments of the market, uh, the trading volume has uh, increased uh, substantially uh, in the small and mid-cap space. So if I want to look at the top 1,000 companies uh, which are listed, so beyond 250 uh, companies uh, uh, which are listed has seen trade uh, one-year average trading volume in the trading times almost close to 240 percentage of uh, what they saw uh, in Feb 20. Uh, so clearly, uh, uh, some of those value was supported by earnings growth, but uh, the trading volume or liquidity has a, a, a very high role in, in what the kind of returns which we saw in the recent periods. So with all those uh, liquidity uh, data coming forth, uh, there is a possibility that flows uh, could moderate in those segments. Uh, and hence, you know, we might see uh, kind of muted returns uh, going forward in, in, in small and mid-cap space. Um, George, uh, you know, morning, this is Reema here. You know, particularly wanted to get your view in on defense. It's been the darling of investors, a big wealth generator. Uh, but, you know, we were chatting with a guest earlier today, Harish Krishnan, and he said that on an aggregate, the defense index or all the stocks are trading at a price to book of 10 times, which is more expensive than even the consumption names. So, therefore, it's difficult to make a case for uh, generating value or even over the medium term. Uh, where do you stand on defense? Uh, see, when we look at uh, the order books uh, of those defense companies, we might see uh, that, you know, going up multifold in the last uh, uh, few quarters. But the point to note here is generally the execution times are fairly long and, and they are quite working capital intensive. So it's very unlikely that uh, the earnings growth or, or those order execution will catch up to uh, what the valuation kind of indicates at this point. Uh, so it's it's very reasonable to expect, uh, in, uh, you know, it's it's very... Uh, unlikely that, you know, those stocks would make uh, reasonable returns, at least in the medium term. Right. Uh, George, we are heading into earnings season and we'll start off with IT as companies will come out with their numbers starting the uh, second week of April. What is your expectation there? Are there any key factors that you are watching out for when it comes to these IT companies? The commentary has not been very positive from companies like Accenture. Even some of the Indian companies like Tech Mahindra have not been very bullish on the prospects for FY25. What's your sense there? Uh, see, clearly the market expectations are not very high in those IT names. And if we look at uh, when we speak to companies, uh, it, it appears like, you know, the next, uh, it has, we have not reached a phase where revenue growth would accelerate in a meaningful manner in the next uh, immediate few quarters. Uh, but clearly the deal wins have remained strong. And with the recent correction, some of the large cap names look uh, uh, kind of reasonable from an upside potential, at least relative to where uh, the upside potential is there for the overall broader markets. And it's, it's very unlikely that those tech spends would differ indefinitely for a prolonged period of time. So our sense is at some point in the next year, uh, we could see some acceleration uh, in those order deal wins converting to uh, revenue uh, at, at some point over the next year. And that should uh, provide some support to the IT names. Of course, when we come down the market cap, uh, the valuations are quite uh, stretched uh, in, the, in the mid and small cap kind of IT names. 
where, where the ask is slightly higher. But from a large cap IT, uh, IT valuation perspective, uh, there is at least scope for getting better returns compared to markets. Okay, so IT can provide um, you know better returns than the market. Uh, George, leave us with some you know interesting ideas. Any themes that you know, uh, which is not per se. I don't want consensus ideas. Like you know, private sector banks, large cap banks, they're on everyone's buy list, and the case to own them has been well made. Give us some other interesting ideas that you have spotted. Uh, see, uh, it's it's very uh, hard to give uh, a sectoral theme other than uh, the names which you mentioned. Uh, but but uh, some of our recent additions has been one has been a private life insurance company uh, where uh, they had some trouble with one of their largest channel partner and our sense for is uh, the the trouble with the channel uh, the channel has kind of bottomed out in that uh, in terms of share and growth should accelerate from here on and the other recent addition which we made was a consumer durables company where the company has a fairly strong uh, brand record. And margins have, uh, of course, taken a hit because of uh, heightened pricing pressure in that segment. Uh, so it's it's very hard to identify uh, specific sectors, but there are uh, companies which have been going through uh, some bit of fancy and trouble in the recent past. And, and investors should kind of uh, take a bottom-up approach in terms of uh, identifying opportunities. All right, George, we leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining in and sharing your thoughts on the markets and specific sectors as well. That was George Thomas there of Quantum AMC. The Nifty continues to gain and it's almost turned positive now. It's now at above the mark of 22.050. It's still down two tenths of a percent, but it's off 100 points off the lowest point of the day as it continues to build on. But HDFC Bank and Reliance continue to remain the pressure points for the index, although ICICI Bank has recovered slightly from the lowest point of the day. And LNT is now the top contributor in terms of the index upside. And along with the Bajaj Twins and Tata Motors is also jumping in there with gains of a percent. Time for a short break here on Trading R. When we return, we will get you excerpts from our exclusive conversation with market veteran Ramdev Agrawal of Motilal Oswal Financial Services. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Trading R here on CNBC TV 18. Some movers from the broader markets that pull up Dr. Lal Path Labs and that is trading at the highest point of the day, trading with gains of over 5% and that is on the back of a double upgrade that it has received from Kotak Institutional Equities and they have also raised their target on the stock to 23.60, citing valuation comfort compared to Metropolis and that stock is doing very well for itself. The other stock, we don't talk about it very often, but that is Savita Oil Technologies. It's a 3,000 crore market cap stock. It's a small cap name and that stock is trading 6.5% higher. At one point it was up 10% and that is because of a block deal that took place on Friday and SBI Mutual Fund has now acquired around 3% stake in the company in that block deal. The only other mutual fund that has stake in Savita Oil is HDFC Mutual Fund and that has around 7.5% stake there. Some of the other stocks that are doing very well for themselves are the railway names. Who else? IRFC, RVNL, Two stocks that are the top gainers on the mid-cap index in today's session. RVNL signed an MOU uh, last week that was for around 230 crore rupees. That stock is now up 6%. IRFC is also doing well for itself, nearing the mark of 150, now 5% higher for IRFC. It saw a bit of a steep correction from that record highs of around 190 that it made recently and it's now trying to recover some of those losses. But in an exclusive conversation with my colleague Surbhi Upadhyay, Ramdev Agrawal of Motila Loswal Financial Services says that he is not worried about large chunks of money going out of the market. Listen in to what he had to say. In 2023, we saw massive blocks coming in. It's continuing in 24. Yeah. And this is also a question that comes up uh, because at the end of the day, because of the, the retail revolution, uh, a lot of the buyers are mutual funds. So, I mean, I am buying at the end of the day when maybe a promoter is selling or maybe yeah, a yeah, very sophisticated team. They also have a right to sell. They have a right to sell, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But is there any reason to worry because they are supposedly smart there insiders? There is nothing to worry. They're and they're natural selling? market phenomenon. Okay. Surabhi, you must understand. Mm -hmm. If you raise the prices, supply will come. Mm. Asman says supply hai. <laughs> Whether FIs sell, promoters yeah. sell, block deal happens, new issuance come, 
supply will come. So first three years we saw the boom in the demand side mm. because of this inflow. Mm. Now you see the the uh, what do you call the the power of supply. But that does that mean that it may be for an end no, there's it, a bit it, of a top no, in no, the market. No, no. Yeah, don't become too topish. This that Achha. it's a part of the game. Mm. See, it, it, see if you if you're playing football. Mm. I mean, if one guy is Manchester United, other side is uh, Motila Oswal team. <laughs> what will happen? They'll just go and keep hitting. Oh. Why? There has to be supply. Hmm. Supply will come. And that is the healthiest part. Okay. That's the real role of the stock market. Oh. To supply secondary liquidity as well as primary liquidity. Right, right, so, right. my only wish yeah. is that liquidity which is, uh, liquidity which is taken away from the market, hmm. that should, do, sh should have a lot more, uh, what you call, primary component. Hmm. Like where uh, regulators have said, T plus 3 for the listing. Hmm. So they are making every single effort hmm. to see that money is being raised yeah. very quickly in the economy. Yeah. So that, you know, entrepreneurs who are seeking to come in, say, typically for the stock market, who comes? The guys who have about, say, 3, 400 crores turnover, 40, 50, 60 crores, 100 crores hmm. profit, they only come for the listing. Hmm. And they have a huge aspiration. A hospital company who has, say, 1,000 rooms, he wants to set up 2,000 rooms. Hmm. Okay, hmm. come, hmm. we'll give you 2,000 crores, 3,000 crores, hmm. and you set up 3,000 3, rooms. And that, that is what is the chain effect in the tourism or infrastructure or whatever. Uh, yeah. So that, see, mm -hmm. so what happens is the, uh, the equity boom mm. uh, has the wealth effect yeah. in the system. Yeah. Yeah. And wealth effect has two things. One, it leads to massive consumption boom. Yeah. Uh, consumption hota hai, mm. then you get the GST. Mm. Government gets the tax. tax. Yeah. Government gets the tax, they're able to spend in the infrastructure yeah. much more aggressively. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one part of it. Second, yeah. if, you have, if you have wealth effect, then there is a boom in the real estate. So the entire real estate and we're pack that, all yeah. over the country, yeah. whether it's the land, building, flats, mm -hmm. houses, mm -hmm. everything is 50 to 100% up. Sure. That has its own momentum in the economy. Sure. So all this put together, I don't know, many more effects would be there. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but clearly the uh, consumer confidence is very high, moral mm -hmm. is very high, employees are very happy with their shop mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. you know, priced well. So mm -hmm. clearly there is a lot of effect in the economy mm -hmm. and that effect from the wealth Mm. is going to be added effect apart from whatever CapEx is doing mm. as per the general budget. So combine these two are going to give us 7 to 8% growth rate, okay. which is what the economists are not getting. Mm. Economists are saying 6.5. Yeah. I mean, they're very reluctant to say even seven, seven. 7, 7. All our economists yes. are below 7. Yeah. You know, yeah. but actual yeah. numbers is about 7.5, 8. Mm. I'm telling you, every single guy will be shocked. Sure. If the market remains, mm. uh, market goes from, say, mm. 22,000 to 24, mm. 25,000 in the next 12 months, we might cross 8% growth. If the prices go up, Asman Sevhi supply aega. Interesting thoughts there from Ramdev Agrawal of Motilal Oswal Financial Services. And on that note, we bring down the curtains on this edition of Trading Art from Reema, myself and the team that put this show together. Thank you so much for watching. Halftime Report takes the action forward.